It's my great pleasure and uh, slightly, uh, slightly nervously I introduce uh, John Pilger here, uh, an, a legend of, uh, of journalism, Australian who's essentially built a career in London and as an international journalist, as we say in the flyer, a global correspondent. Um, and we've been discussing what, uh, what we might talk about today and uh, I think we might start with the state of the media because there's a lot of journalists here and uh, you've seen the state of the media over a long period of time. You've been highly critical of the media at times. How would you see, thing, how would you see the media seen, not just in Australia but globally at the moment? And, John, is there any hope for us? Um, that's a, almost an ecclesiastical question, isn't it? Um, I'm not sure I'm equipped to answer the second one. but. I think one of, one of the things that is very interesting now is that the public's distrust in us is at an all-time low. It's been on a nosedive for a long time. And I've always felt the public was well ahead of us. Um, I can't remember exactly when, but I, uh, I became I suppose quite intrigued by the fact that we, and this was working in Fleet Street, this, guy, this certainly came from there, is that there was, we had a, there was almost a contempt, bordering on a contempt or a patronizing view of readers and often viewers, that the, the distance between us as journalists and broadcasters and our audience was, was huge and getting greater. And I think that distance has become, uh, has become something that the, the audience now marks, particularly young people. Uh, we were just discussing there that The, the Guardian, in, a, in a, a population of over 60 million people, The Guardian sells 146,000 copies of a newspaper, visceral newspaper. Yes, there is lots of online stuff, we know that. But basically, that's the newspaper. Um, now, there are many reasons for that, and they're not all down to a rejection. But rejection is certainly part of it. And I don't think uh, many of us have uh, look that square in the eye. Uh, there are so many economic problems, there are so many pressures that perhaps prevent us doing so, but that, that seems to be the most salient truth about the state of the media at the moment, is our relationship with the, with the public. And I think that applies, that applies in this country, but I'm, I'm, obviously I'm talking mainly about Western countries, not entirely. In, in the United States, the figures of young trainee journalists going into public relations are spectacular. The proportion has changed completely. So in some parts of the country, you have a majority rejecting what was often the, the great ambition of young people there as it has been in this country. So what do you see as the malaise? Uh, I mean, the, the commercial pressures are, the, as you say, the things we mostly focus up on. Um, but I mean, I, I and many of my colleagues sincerely, you know, believe in what we do and attempt to do the best job we yeah. can. Why, why do you think the public's rejecting us? Well, I, I, look, uh, why are Michael, they rejecting you, you, you don't have to know that because, say that, because we know that there are plenty of honourable exceptions. They are... Uh, they still survive, like yourself, on newspapers. But in other parts of the world, uh, most of the best journalists have been subject to what I would call a complete defenestration. They are no longer work on, um, on, on, uh, on, on territorial media, on territorial newspapers. That's certainly true in the United States. The, the, the best journalists, in my opinion, the ones I admire, now all work online exclusively. And they range from the likes of Seymour Hirsch, 
late Bob Parry has just died, uh, Gareth Porter, and many others who I regard as some of the finest journalists in the world. They can't get jobs. They can't get jobs on newspapers, not because newspapers can't afford them. These people are at a stage where they probably work for ne next to nothing. Not quite, but near, near, near enough. That's not the reason. It's because they do their job too well. They do it as you describe it. I think the media has been corporatized. It is that contamination of the corporation runs through right through our lives, through education, even into our families, into our language. In Australia, it's so striking where corporate, almost corporate interchange, language between people um, is, 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 is almost straight out of the corporate the corporate manual, and I think that has run into the media, but it doesn't mean there are not people like you, and there are not great stories in the age, and there are not people that uh, are, uh, are not worthy of their, their Walkleys. Of course not. Uh, perhaps, in one sense, journalism has always been about honorable exceptions has always been about fighting formulas. When I started on Sir Frank Packer's Daily Telegraph, boy, was there a formula. You know, no black faces, uh, which I later found was a rule. Uh, uh, and um, the kind of, I would say, political bigotry in that newspaper that was it was, was, was standard throughout it, and yet it was, in terms of being a newspaper, a very, very good newspaper, and it had some really brilliant journalists on it. So the formula has already been there, but I think it's now much more insidious. It's interesting because, I mean, you know, the media has always been corporate. I mean, it's been, well, for, for the last century or so, it's been a corporate, a corporate, a corporation. It's been a money-making yeah. enterprise. You, you know, uh, yeah. uh, were in the Sydney newspaper wars probably in the 1960s. Uh, you know, the, the, the titans of industry are fighting mm. over, over media influence and so on. Yeah. So why do you see it now worse than before? Well, I think it's... There was always a recognition of just what you, I think what you've said. I mean, newspapers came out of really uh, um, extraordinary, ex extraordinary, uh, it's like in the, Uni the United States and Australia is similar, in only in size. I mean, the, the numbers of small newspapers that uh, represented their communities uh, often without fear or favor, often that landed the editor into prison uh, as uh, Edward Smith, who edit edited the Sydney Monitor, was put away by Governor Darling for criminal libel. Criminal libel is the way you got editors. And all over, they tried the same thing in the United States. That's what, that's in a way, that's what helped to discredit libel laws in the United States because so many editors were being attacked and they were small town editors. They, yeah, they usually carried the prejudice of their community but not, not entirely. So you could almost call them crusading entities as newspapers. It was around the turn of the century that the whole thing was corporized, incorporated, if you like. Uh, and, um, I mean, it, it certainly raged, it raged on in Sydney with the Sydney wars between, almost reflecting Fleet Street, the wars between big and powerful and often very gross men who, 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 ran, who ran the newspapers. Um, but out of that atmosphere, I think there was often the likelihood that would come people who would not necessarily reject it wholly, but were mavericks. Um, um, and 
But today, corporatism, awful word, sorry, but corporatism runs for everything like a, like a, a kind of slick. Uh, and it's, it, it, it largely determines, I think, often without those of us who make the decisions in the media knowing or being aware, it determines the decisions they'll make. You know, that, that business friendly equals good. There is no debate. It's over. It's like the politics. There's no debate. Tweedledum and Tweedledee. So, so is there, do you think, a room for and uh, a need for a continuing maverick journalists to surf above that? And, uh, you, you know, we speak, uh, speaking to John Pilger here, who, you know, uh, has, is a well-known maverick, but has also published most commonly in commercial uh, media. So, yeah. is there still, you know, is there still room for that in the next generation? Well, absolutely. And I've, I've been aware that the moment of the danger of slipping outside of what I don't care now, of course, but I used to care of slipping outside what was called the mainstream. Uh, so. Um, and it's true, I built my career at a fortunate time in Fleet Street when there were opportunities. But what was interesting then, looking back, there was a space, and I think it existed too in Australia later in a different form. There was a space for um, journalism that did go against the formula, that was dissenting. So, Example, Lord Beaverbrook owned the, the Evening Standard and, 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 and his chief foreign correspondent was then, when I started there, my hero, a man called James Cameron. Uh, and Cameron took a decidedly very different from almost everything that Beaverbrook stood for. Uh, so that, that would not happen today. It simply wouldn't happen. And it wouldn't happen almost especially in those parts of the media that still suggest that they are, for want of a better word, liberal, such as The Guardian. It just wouldn't happen. That, that maverick, um, um, I mean, in the United States, for example, the great maverick was Seymour Hirsch. Um, here's a man who broke more huge stories than just about anybody I can think of in the 20th century. He can't, he can't get published now in the United States. He can't even get published in the London Review of Books anymore. He is published by Die Welt in the back page in Germany. And the Germans may well start to worry about him after a while too. He's too much of a maverick. He's got too many good stories. He treads on too many toes, and that's what journalism should, is about. Uh, let's zoom back out, zoom out uh, from journalism, and I'm probably going to ask you uh, the biggest question there is uh, about the state of the world. You said to me in an email uh, when we were discussing this uh, that the anti-China, anti-Russia mantras are as crude as the old Cold War. Um, what do you mean by that? Well, I grew up in the first Cold War. We're now in the second Cold War. It's different. But the first Cold War was it's so familiar. Same old stuff. Uh, the movies were a bit more interesting because they're more obvious. You know, John Wayne and so on. But, but basically, uh, you know, I started on a Cold Warring newspaper that used to employ a a Hungarian emigre, I remember called Dr. Emery Barks. No one ever saw this guy, but he was given in a tabloid an entire spread. In fact, I don't think he existed. <laughs> He's probably David McNichol or somebody He's the sitting editor. there writing feverish stuff. It was all, and it was all this anti communist claptrap uh, across the things and how they were coming to eat antipode and babies very soon. And um, so, but it was, it was ignored. I think 
these days, particularly in the United States, and I spend a fair amount of time in the US, uh, newspapers that do have a proud record, New York Times, Washington Post, Los Angeles Times, are now buying into this drivel that s says that uh, the enemies of the world are just as they were all those years ago. Uh, and therefore, let's blame everything on that. The Russiagate thing, which is a complete non-story. We used to have a wonderful term, didn't we, called beat up. This is the ultimate beat up. Uh, and, uh, but once you start down the road of almost a kind of invention by stealth, uh, then you, you kind of create a m momentum. Uh, and I've read front page stories here of about, about China. And I looked for the source through the whole story, started all over the front. It was our friends in ASIO. ASIO! <laughs> Why should any, any journalist trust ASIO? And I mean that seriously. I know that. Why should any journalist ch trust MI6? I've had some experience with. Why should any journalist trust any intelligence agency in any country, especially now, now that they've, they also have discovered public relations and are vying for a, a political place in, the, in, in, uh, in, in society. But the whole thing was based on, uh, based on ASIO. Or if you don't want ASIO straight up, then you'll have the various think tanks that are connected to it. I did see a story from a, a Beijing correspondent the other day. Uh, since uh, Z has uh, uh, extended, decided to extend his term indefinitely, no surprise there. Uh, uh, everything in her story, every source in her story was an American or a, an Australian expert or think tank, nothing from where she was. Uh, now that's not new, it used to be intelligence sources, but we did, we were rather skeptical about them. So you, you, know, you don't see any reason to be skeptical about uh, China, China's uh, yeah. approach to the West or Russia's approach to the West, particularly US? But that's not, no, you, you, you're leaping ahead, no. Uh, <laughs> I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that. I, before we think about China and Russia, we should think about ourselves. That's the problem. We should look in the mirror. How are we doing the story about ourselves? Who's feeding us this stuff? You know, the whole ABC discovery of, of the documents of five governments. Well. There's so much crying out from that story. You only have to read the, the political history of Australia for the last half century to, to more than cry out, to demand some answers to the questions. I don't have them. But um, with these, these new national security, um, the National Security Amendment Act in particular, uh, which now makes illegal journalists dealing, use the word dealing with, with people. Okay, they may, they won't, they may not, they won't, they may not enforce that, but they shouldn't have got to the point, we as watchdogs should not have allowed them to get to the point where they can feel free to be the source of a story across a major newspaper without any countervailing truth. So it's got nothing to do about being skeptical about Russia and China. It should be skeptical about everything. Absolutely everything. Skeptical. There's good advice for journalism in general. Yeah. Um, can I ask you about Trump? He's in some senses the biggest story in the world and um, you've, I think, probably worn a little bit of flack for being somewhat more sympathetic to him in the early days than, than some other journalists were. 
where, uh, where do you stand on, on Trump and, and, and on the issue, I suppose, of whether or not, uh, you know, the, the stories that are, that are threatening to bring uh, most, most discredit to, to, to Trump are coming very often from security services? Is this the, I mean, the, the analysis has been that the deep state is kind of asserting itself over a maverick president. Is that... They've won. Well, that's always been the case. That's always been the case. Donald Trump is uh, president of the United States. That should be enough. You know, if you say anything else, uh, and, and should be regarded as, uh, uh, as someone holding power, uh, the power allowed him, showcasing power. In fact, by comparison, Donald Trump appalling, grotesque, though he may be. In fact, I've always felt that Trump, the system had finally produced its ultimate caricature in Trump. But they're all caricatures. Have we forgotten George W. Bush? Trump is a wimp compared with Obama. Obama was possibly, in terms of foreign policy, the most violent president, uh, certainly since before since Nixon. He had seven wars going. He conducted, a, he conducted a, a, an assassination program across the world. He jailed more whistleblowers and threatened journalism more than any president. George W. Bush didn't, didn't prosecute a single one. Obama, Obama did a good job of what he was there, basically, for. Trump really has frightened people in the United States, and I think they have, I think the great national security institutions, which is called the deep state, it's not really a deep state, have won in a struggle uh, to uh, assert themselves. Their, their president was Hillary Clinton because she was tried and tested. Hillary Clinton was, would have well outdone uh, Obama as a, for her violence, I would have thought there'd be a major invasion by now, possibly of Iran. Uh, anything's possible at any time. I think Trump is most dangerous over Korea. And what wasn't emphasized during the, in the reporting of Turnbull's visit, I felt, was that Trump used Turnbull's visit to talk about a second phase in the, in the American plans for Korea. Because what, what they really fear is the peace that's breaking out on the Korean peninsula. peninsula. Uh, not quite breaking out, but there are very hopeful shoots of, of peace between North and South in the most, probably the most homogeneous people on Earth, the Koreans. Um, so, I mean, it's a, it, it's, it's, I suppose I've never known since I've been a correspondent wandering around the world, reporting things and making films, I've never known there to be such, more than a rumor of war, but such an atmosphere of war. It's different from others. It's not 1939. Um, but it's constant. It's, it, it, it's as General Petraeus said, we, we live now in an age of perpetual war and that war shall be fought primarily through the media. And I think propaganda is, and, and the media is, is essential in the arsenal of that. I think it's a, it's a war atmosphere. When you, Australia, building this huge arsenal uh, and, and Turnbull announcing a, a weapons sales, sales program in, the, in probably the most secure country on earth. Australia has no enemies, no one's going to attack it, no one wants to, here it is, uh, left alone could just get on, but no. It's going to involve itself in the, the turmoil 
that is leading somewhere. So, um, circling back a little bit to, to what you were saying about the media, if the media's role, traditional role, is to, to keep, keep the bastards honest and, and we're perhaps not doing it, what do you think of social media, which uh, I think uh, early on the, the kind of uh, the idea was that, uh, that, that it would be wholly democratic and, uh, and able to, to produce citizen journalism and do a much better job of, of kind of crowdsourcing uh, you know, accountability in a way that the, the mainstream corporate media wasn't doing. Um, has it lived up to that promise uh, or has it been corrupted as we're told by fake news and, uh, and uh, you know, manipulated by, by large government entities? I think it's all of those things have happened actually. I think the, the, the net is such an infinite landscape that of uh, uh, of everything, you know, and, but uh, I don't pick up a newspaper in the morning as a journalist, I log on. So you're not contributing to the Guardian's 167,000 sales? No, no, I don't, I don't want their, their view of the world, I don't, I want a, I want, there are, there are websites run by journalists who are absolutely committed to journalism that will give me a digest of others. But um, so social media uh, <laughs> performs that, 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 that's a very important balancing to, I would think, a beleaguered um, conventional media, beleaguered in its own economic terms but beleaguered in its relationship with the public. I mean, the whole idea of fake news is a completely false contrivance. Every, every war um, since, um, probably since Waterloo, certainly since the Crimea, uh, has been started with fake news, one after the other. It was, wasn't it, uh, uh, David Lloyd George, who at the height of the slaughter known as the Great Wars, said to C.P. Scott, the editor of The Guardian, if people knew the truth, the war would stop tomorrow, but they don't know and they can't know. And that was exactly 100 years ago. Uh, and we've all wars from the justifications for dropping uh, nuclear weapons for starting wars in Korea for, uh, uh, for trying to, uh, for the whole long Vietnam debacle was all started with, with fake news. Uh, and then uh, very recent memory, the, 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 the horrific invasion of Iraq, which has disturbed the Middle East as never before, since well before the Ottoman Empire, in such a chaotic way, killing so many people, dispossessing so many people, creating this ISIS death cult and spilling over into all these fragile societies. That was started with fake news. They made it up. We know. Uh, weapons of mass destruction was made up. England's called the dodgy dossier, the whatever you want to call it, the 10 Downing Street memo and all the rest of the evidence, they made it up. Um, that, was, that was fake news. Anything else that pops up on, on, on social media is pretty small beer compared with that. So what do we do? What do we do about it, John? What we do? <laughs> What's to be done? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we should know what to do, shouldn't we? Well, we should. No, no, you can't say to the leader, what should we do? You know, what should we do? Tell us, give us the word. No way. We're journalists. We should know what to do. It's like in, in, in countries where they don't have ASIOs that you get annoyed about them, reading about them in the paper. They actually come and kick your door down and murder people and so on, they know what to do. Some of the journalists in those countries 
know what to do. The best journalists I've probably ever met have been in countries like the Philippines, Honduras, other parts of Latin America, Kashmir, um, in, uh, in, in Southern Africa, extraordinarily brave, uh, completely unthinking actually about their own, um, their own well-being, but they know what to do. I'm, I want to throw it open to the floor for questions, but uh, I want to finally ask you, uh, you told a, a great story in your uh, acceptance speech for the Hall of Fame uh, uh, award that you received late last year uh, about walking into the um, Sydney newsroom of Consolidated Press. Te can you tell us that story and then tell us uh, if, you know, what, what would you say to the young you um, from your vantage point today? I think I was... I think there was... It's a, it's a hard world to navigate through these days and I think I wouldn't be so presumptuous to compare myself then. This was... I... Uh, I left uh, Sydney High School and dismayed my parents by telling them I wasn't going to university, that I was joining uh, a newspaper. They thought, you know, he's going to be a reporter. I wasn't. I was going on the Sydney Sun as a copy boy with no hope of a cadetship. And uh, uh, my, uh, my dad, although he, I have to say, he, he, uh, uh, he took it back. He understood, <laughs> he's understood the argument, referred, he said, you're joining the Legion of Liars. <laughs> so that wasn't a very good start for uh, one sense. I didn't, I ignored what he had to say anyway, but so on I went. Um, and I, I've always felt that, I mean, I labored away as a, as a copy boy watching the turmoil on an afternoon paper with Lindsay Clinch as the editor, uh, who was, Breck could have just described this character, was straight out of the front page, um, with people banging coffee cups and shouting, boy, and, um, but I loved it. And I would think the day I, uh, I got my cadetship, on the Telegraph uh, was certainly among the happiest days of my life. Um, the whole idea of newspapers, which I'd been absolutely fascinated by since I was a kid, delivering them and jumping on trams with them and all of that, was hopeless. It was hopelessly romantic. Uh, and the romance was well satisfied by this, this uh, uh, dump of a place that had panel walls, that had a particular smell that um, yeah, was sort of print, kind of, but there was mainly sweat and all sorts of cigarette smoke, mainly because everyone smoked. Um, uh, I've, I found... Uh, the people I met, the people who helped me as uh, a young uh, cadet uh, among the, uh, the, the most professional, and I'm careful in using that word, that's been corporatized too, but the kindest people who did understand what being a journalist, journalist was about, they couldn't often for some of them couldn't be that because of the, the restrictions on that newspaper. You could only go so far and no, no farther. Uh, but it was, um, uh, uh, I, I, f I found the whole idea of, of journalism that you would be allowed into people's lives. You could turn up with a notebook 
and ask people questions, they would open the door and let you in. I mean, extraordinary. It's magic, isn't it? Uh, and, and tell you things and, and trust you. And that's why the loss of that trust is a grievous thing. I suppose I, I felt this when I went to England and I started there in Manchester in the height of the worst winter for 400 years and before the Clean Air Act and so on. But I discovered the riches of the post-industrial revolution and people talking about working lives. It was the most, it gave me an entree into people's lives that I never thought existed. And I felt, always felt very, very fortunate to have had that. That came out of my, my training here. Maybe Australia was a bit different then when I started, I don't know. I have to say, having already libeled my father, uh, he had, a, he had a, a very powerful effect on on, uh, on us as, uh, as supporters of, as he and my mother used to say, the underdog, repeatedly. And I think that sense then, coming especially after the war, was very, very powerful here. All the, the reporters I started with were ex-servicemen, most of them with the sense they were lucky to be alive. And I ran into the, almost the same group of men in London. Uh, and that produced, it produced multiple mavericks. And I suppose that's why I have such an, an admiration for the, uh, the journalist as maverick. Thank you, John. I'm going to throw it open now to the floor. There's a question here. Barry Donovan, Melbourne Press Club. Thank you, John. It was a very interesting discussion. What um, I want to raise with you, with your great experience, is there's another Australian who started in Australia, a little place in Adelaide and another place then on to, on to Sydney. He then went on to establish a huge empire in the United Kingdom uh, and then the United States. And uh, with your vast experience, I'd be interested to know what sort of on balance legacy that you feel that Rupert Murdoch uh, will have and should have, um, uh, do you have a good word for him? One word. Um, look, I've written books about Murdoch and written about Murdoch and I find it very... M Murdoch's impact. The only thing I've got against being in the Hall of Fame, by the way, is that he's in it too. Uh, he's not an Australian now. He gave up being an Australian. I'm still an Australian. Uh, he uh, surrendered his passport and nationality willingly in order to buy uh, the Fox network. Uh, and uh, I think legacy is a soft word, really. I think his, he was once described by a German biographer, wrote a very good book about the Murdoch Empire and described it as a cultural Chernobyl. And I think that just about sums it up. They're not a sponsor, are they, Mark? <laughs> OK. Another question, Chloe? Oh, sorry. I've got the nod. Um, John Wallace, Asia Pacific Journalism Centre. Thanks, John. As we sit here enjoying our freedom, there's another Australian journalist, and I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about Rupert, uh, Julian Assange, who is uh, languishing in an, in an embassy in London. My perception of it is that we're fairly quiet about it here. We don't make much of a fuss about it. Uh, and journalists don't, uh, as, as a group, I don't think we uh, protest enough about it. That's my personal view. But what's your view? And what, why do you think we're like this? Well, I agree with that suggestion. 
Absolutely, and I think he's been let down uh, by journalists everywhere, and I think he's been let down especially because this is his country by journalists in Australia. Uh, because what Assange is facing, basically the extension of that, and we see so many intimations of it now, the extension of that is what journalists face. Uh, even the, the latest absurd attacks on about Russiagate, that WikiLeaks was manipulated by Russia. Uh, in fact, the um, Hillary Clinton emails were first published by the New York Times, uh, New York Ta Times and Washington Post. Uh, really set that up, that story up and running. Uh, but it is not the editors of those newspapers that has, that has taken the, the, the flack. It has been Assange. I think WikiLeaks has, in many respects, not only changed or ought to have changed how we see much of journalism, I think, and I've had some experience with this because I've seen the kind of anger uh, that Julian Assange draws. I think he and WikiLeaks have shamed a lot of journalism, not so much in this country, but certainly in the United States where they're very, they're very self-conscious about being constitutionally the freest media, freest press in the world, which indeed they are still. Uh, and I think what, his, what WikiLeaks has produced um, is, 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 has been particularly shaming in the US and in the UK. I mean, more, if you like, more scoops, more public interest and public service disclosures have come out of WikiLeaks than uh, uh, from some of the, the most famous newspaper titles in the world. Um, so I can, I can only, I can only think there's a, there's some kind of perverse jealousy there. Uh, the misreporting of the Assange case has really been grotesque. I've had quite a bit to do with it. I know Assange well. Uh, I've written about it. Um, the misreporting, the inaccuracies, the, mis, the, the misinformation about this, of following, if ever there was, a vivid example of journalists as a pack or as Bob Parry used to say, the groupthink of journalism, following uh, the formula, it has been in the reporting of, not of WikiLeaks, but especially of Assange himself. Uh, none of that story, almost none of it, bears any likeness to what I've read over and over again, the truth of it, that is. So, um, what they're trying to do and why he dare not walk out of that embassy and perhaps the best and most experienced and most distinguished human rights lawyer in the world, Gareth Pierce, who has been looking after Julian Assange since the beginning, says that within an hour or two, it's quite likely that a, it's more than quite likely that uh, an extradition order will be placed on Assange and he'll be on his way to the United States and will end up like Chelsea Manning. But unlike Chelsea Manning, he won't be allowed out. Uh, and this grand jury that has been, uh, has been meeting in uh, Virginia for the last uh, five or six years 
has been trying to concoct a charge against him. That's, what it's, that's why they're taking their time. Because what WikiLeaks has done is constitutionally correct. They should be protected by the Constitution, but they're not. And so the most likely charge that um, Assange, if they do get their hands on him, will face will be a World War I espionage um, uh, prosecution, which was used to pursue conscientious objectors during the First World War. That's, that's how desperate they are. I think the behavior of Australian governments has been just a disgrace. Um, Julia Gillard uh, uh, wanted to take his passport away from him, a man charged with nothing, and was to, had to be told by the AFP, you can't do that, Prime Minister. Um, the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the diplomatic cables that uh, WikiLeaks has accessed from Australia show, as they put it, I think the wording is the biggest FBI investigation uh, mounted in modern times is against WikiLeaks. That is against information, against journalism. Um, the Sweden thing was withdrawn, of course, it was a complete, it was a setup from the beginning. The the, uh, and now we find with Assange, Gareth Pierce took him back to, uh, or took his case back to uh, the Chief Magistrate's Court in London to try and get the, the only thing that's hanging over him, that's bail infringe infringement, uh, removed. Uh, and we learn through Freedom of Information that the Crown Prosecution Service has been warning off the Swedes years ago from withdrawing the case. One email says, don't get cold feet. Uh, and the Swedes, when you now look at the emails, the Swedes are saying, basically, there's no case against this man. Why are we still pursuing him? Give him free passage, let him out. Uh, and I'm paraphrasing. Um, so, as you can see, there are, there are multiple heads to this story, but it's, it's, it's an, uh, an epic miscarriage of justice of an Australian who is uh, a journalist in a very different way. Some of us might find that difficult to accept. Others might find it something to be proud of but we should have supported Assange and should be a sp supporting him now as journalists. And I would suggest that the Melbourne Press Club uh, begin its own campaign to, uh, to st stand up for any journalist, any Australian journalist imprisoned abroad should be supported. Um, so, I'm sorry that was a very long-winded answer. It's a very, it's a very, <laughs> it's as I said, it's a multi, it's a multi-headed story. Hi, I'm um, Chloe. Um, if you were an early career female reporter who decided to go it alone and write the stuff that you like to read, how would you do that financially? How would you survive financially? Um, what about potential legal fees or travel and things like that? The first part of your question, if you were a female reporter, did you just Yeah, say? I guess the female's not the main bit, but if yeah. you were an early career reporter and you yeah. decided to go it alone and write the stuff that you were talking about that you like yeah. to read, how would yeah. you do that and survive financially in this time when there's not many readers that like to read that kind of stuff? Well, I suppose I'd do what I did, and that was to leave, go somewhere. You know, I was out before I was 23. Uh, Go and find the story. I once actually advised somebody <laughs> shortly before the Falklands War. I suggested there might be something happening in the Falklands soon. But how did you... How I did felt you, guilty about this and he went and they invaded. How, but, how did you pay for that though? Did you save up money or...? Well, why worry about how you pay for it? Um, you... Um, there are all kinds of ways of of paying for it, of getting 
of getting the money. Flying these days is so cheap. You can get, you can get, to, get to London for, what, a thousand bucks or something, and back, Very even, there. <laughs> whatever. But it's nothing. It's the cheapest. It's the bargain of today. Travel around the world. Travel. Go to places. Follow the story. If you have a particular passion about a story or a part of the world or, or a development somewhere, go there. And I, I think these days it's so cutthroat in people getting their work printed or getting it even online in the major sites that you can't go to you, you can't go to editors and say anymore, give us a job. You, you, I think you have to go with a story. I have a job. I just want, if, I'm just you have a job. Yeah, I'm well, wondering how, well, you, go at, how you go it al alone and, um, and... Alone? Well, just and do still, it. And still make money. Though. It's a bit of a, well, don't worry about making money. <laughs> Sorry, that is a very utopian thing to say to you, but... No, I wouldn't worry so much about that. You're young, you're no doubt dynamic, you've got all kinds of ideas. Um, maybe, you have to, maybe you have to let your wits take over for a while, take a risk. Okay, thank you. Um, we have probably time for one more question. We've got a, a group here from Kilvington Grammar. Oh, we'll, okay, we'll take two more. We'll take uh, down at this table. And then we'll take one from the people from Kilvington Grammar. Thank you so much, John, for your insights. Um, fantastic to hear. I'm really interested to hear about your assessment of uh, what's happening in Turkey. Um, President Erdogan is making widespread constitutional change and there's, at last um, check, there's more journalists incarcerated in Turkey than any other country. So I just wondered what your perception of what's happening with the country and their democracy. Well, yes, you're absolutely right. Turkey has the world record of journalists in prison. But it's been that way for a very long time. And we on the outside have taken minimal notice of that. Uh, many of the, the Kurdish journalists working within Turkey have ended up in prison doing substantial Term. So there's nothing new in terms of the Turkish state, but Turkey is, is a pivot. Turkey is also subject to outside manipulation and knows how to manipulate back. Um, it's, I suppose it's cursed in the way that the Czechs used to say they were cursed uh, by being such a crossroads that it, it it plays both sides. Uh, and its own tension of, of between a secular state and, uh, and, and an Islamic state, but a secular state based on a dictatorship, and that's what Erdogan has really brought in now. We're back to a kind of dictatorship. Um, it, it, it's, it's very complex. Uh, I always say in a country like that, the Turks who are themselves standing up to that in some way inside, inside Turkey particularly, uh, need our moral support. They don't need our big power support. That's the last thing they need. Their invasion, Erdogan's invasion of Syria is, is, uh, um, is, is, is a classic case of trying to, and all governments do this. That's why we're worried about what Trump might do to use an invasion, use an in war to garner some kind of support. So that's, that's a hopeless situation, that, that, in, that particular invasion. Um, yeah, I know people here who have family and are extremely worried about it. They're very careful with what they say on Facebook. Uh, and I can well understand that. But I, I wouldn't even begin to suggest a solution there, uh, except just to simply give 
support as much as one can to democratic forces. One final question. Hi, John. I'm Shreya from Kilvington. Um, just in light of what you were saying about corporatisation, um, I was just wondering, um, with the rise of power amongst these corporate giants um, within the global arena, to what degree would you say that they influence the decisions of IGOs such as the UN who strive to remain politically neutral? To what degree would you say that they influence their decisions that are made that essentially affect the entire world? Hmm. Well, I don't think the UN is neutral. There are parts of the new UN that are certainly independent, but the UN is run in an anachronistic way. It has a, a Security Council that is sort of, is, is, uh, is basically a great powers forum. They let others come in and sit on it from time to time, but that's, it's basically theirs. The Secretary General uh, of the UN is never uh, chosen without Washington's approval. And the, the actions and statements of Mr. Guterres, the present Secretary General, uh, illustrate that. Um, but the UN, there are still some very interesting things about the UN. They're, they, they're, I, I, I was astonished to find just there are people who do care about being quite moral international civil servants and they come out of the tradition of the committees of the UN, the decolonization, a lot of the UNESCO people, the, the, uh, uh, the working parties on, on arbitrary detention. I think those advisory bodies do have very considerable power. They always upset the likes of Tony Abbott or somebody when they come here and they remind Australia that it treats its indigenous people appallingly. Uh, and uh, uh, the, the, immediately the great defensiveness comes up, usually with some abuse thrown in. So therefore they are having an impact. And they, their power, I think, is to keep on an agenda, keep an agenda of of, uh, of freedom, of democracy, of, of people um, trying to be as free as they can within difficult situations. Um, so I'm not quite answering your question, but I think that the, the, the power of the corporations is such these days that it is, it is something that really has to be faced as the great, almost, it's not an unseen power, but it's a power within our lives. It's no longer just the government. The government is usually in cahoots with the corporations, completely. You know, both in this country, that's, it is, uh, in the United States, that's what it is. And for them to have front page scoop saying that Abbott's office has taken money from a Chinese businessman because he, had, he was associated with the Communist Party is so absurd uh, when uh, the associations with some of the most rapacious uh, organizations and parties happen within our own societies. Um, it again, it comes back to understanding what the corporation is. You know, the corporation used to be, people hated it. Going back into the 19th century, as you probably know, the corporation was, was um, uh, considered the enemy of the people. And no politician would dare have anything to do with it because basically it was autocratic. It did what it wanted to do. It was, you know, it, 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 it carved up swathes of the world and countries. Now it's, now you can't sue, uh, or rather the corporations can sue. They're like human beings, you know. They, they are, they're dictatorships, uh, top-down dictatorships within, within our countries that have enormous political influence. Um, I think it comes down to us 
beginning to address that and understanding it. That's the first thing. I mean, it was Edward Bernays who was said to have uh, invented the term public relations 100 years ago uh, because he thought that propaganda was getting a bad name uh, during the First World War. Uh, whether or that not that's entirely true, but I think there's a, an element of truth to it. But he referred to an invisible government. And that was simply of the great propaganda corporations. Uh, and I don't think the government is invisible anymore. I think it was in the past. I think it's there. We should know what it is, but we should understand it. John, that's regrettably all we have time for today. Um, thank you very much. I think Mark has something to say. Hello, that work? Yes, uh, thank you both uh, very much, and John in particular, for that uh, uh, terrific uh, presentation. And uh, I'm delighted that you're going to help me find some new sponsors for the Melbourne Press Club. That's wonderful. <laughs> um, as a small token of our esteem, uh, a copy of our uh, New York Times number one best selling book, uh, Media Legends, which carries profiles of the foundation inductees of the Australian Media Hall of Fame. The bad news is that you're not in it. But we're publishing a second edition later this year in which you certainly will appear. But in the meantime, you can read more about Rupert and Keith and, uh, <laughs> and this. So, John, thank you very much thank indeed. You. Thank, you. thank you. And Michael, thank you for your, your part. <laughs>